Okay, so hello everyone for the third day. So um, today, as you can see, my background is different. I'm not in Valencia. I'm actually in Castel de Fez, ICFO, near Barcelona. So I was having lunch a moment ago right there. So uh, it's good to see you all, you know, good to enjoy. It's fantastic weather in Spain. So I'm going to continue with um, you know, the subject of more quantum matter, which I gave uh, you know, the lecture yesterday and the day before yesterday. On the first day, if you remember, I spoke about, you know, it was an introduction to magic and graphene and the discovery of correlated insulated behaviors and superconductivity. And yesterday we went a bit more in depth into some of the correlated behavior that uh, magic and graphene exhibits. Nematicity, uh, competing orders, you know, the, this cascade of phase transitions that we see in compressibility and then strange metal behavior at the end. And today, I want to tell you about the next generation more quantum matter. You know, we call this more magic 3.0. Okay, so let's let's see where we go. So, just as a reminder, okay, more quantum matter is a new platform for strongly correlated physics and also for topological physics. Okay, traditionally we've counted with, you know, quantum materials, you know, atomic scale dimensions and ultra cold atoms in optical lattices with micro scale dimensions. These are two very versatile platforms to study correlated physics. And now we have a new one, more quantum matter, with a nice intermediate length scale between these other two platforms. Yeah? So using these more quantum, uh, quantum matter platforms, they have a number of you know, correlated and, and topological behaviors that have been observed. In fact, many of the cases of condensed matter physics have already been observed using very simple ingredients, okay? So we've seen, you know, correlated insulators, superconductivity, various topological phases, magnetism, nematicity, more effort electricity, I forgot to include here strange metal and many other things, yeah? Now, arguably, the phase that has attracted the most attention has been superconductivity, okay? So it's still sort of a little bit special within condensed matter physics, superconductivity. And in magic angle, twist the bilayer graphene, the bilayer case, okay? Robust superconductivity has been, you know, seen and reproduced by many groups. And what do I mean by robust superconductivity? On one hand, the observation of zero resistance. Okay, so when you cool down, you know, these are two different devices, magic and graphene. Your resistance goes down, you know, linearly. This is strange metal behavior, and then there is a superconductive transition, and the superconductive you know, resistance goes down to zero. Okay, you have also flat voltage current characteristics with sharp switching, the critical current. That's another signature that this behavior, it's not just that the resistance goes down at zero bias, it's that you have a finite, you know, you can send a finite current bias through your sample and have zero voltage dissipation, okay? And then there is a sharp switching to a dissipative state. And perhaps, you know, as importantly, if not most importantly, is the observation of Josephson phase coherence, okay? So if you apply a perpendicular magnetic field in a region of your device where you have, you know, superconducting islands coexisting with non-superconducting islands, you can observe Fraunhofer-like interference patterns of your critical current. So that demonstrates that there is Josephson phase coherence, and this is the last thing that truly 100% confirms that this is a robust two-dimensional superconductor. So I'm showing data from these papers here, but this robust superconductivity has been reproduced and extended by many, many groups nowadays. Now, this robust superconductivity is in contrast with signatures of you know, what is known as perhaps fragile superconductivity, and some people don't even know for sure if this is superconductivity or not in many other more systems, okay? So all of these systems, trilayer graphene aligned to HVM, Bilayer graphene twisted on top of bilayer graphene, twisted transition metal dichalcogenides, twisted monolayer graphene, bilayer graphene. All of these systems, people have reported observations which are consistent with superconductivity. For example, resistivity versus temperature curves, which go down at some point. They have this neat type behavior, and sometimes they even go to zero resistance. Okay. But, you know, however, there are key issues that make people doubtful whether these are truly superconductivity or not, or maybe there's this very fragile superconducting behavior. One is, for example, that the nonlinear voltage current characteristics, although they are nonlinear, 
they do not have sharp switching behavior. They're more you know, nonlinear like this, okay? And this is not necessarily, you know, superconductivity, okay? And most importantly, there's no report of just some phase coherence from Hofer-like patterns in any of these systems, okay? And the reproducibility in general has been very limited. You know, it's, it's not like you know magical ballet or thing where you can make you know ten samples and you know, it always shows superconductivity if you are within that magical range. These things have been you know sporadic reports and not very clear. So that led to a lot of people to ask the question: Okay, could it be that magic angle twisted by Lake graphene is the only robust more superconductor? Okay, and as, as of a few months ago, we know that the answer is not. Okay. There's at least one other robust more superconductor, and that is mirror symmetric magic angle trilayer, twisted trilayer graphene. So MATTG, okay, instead of MATBG, okay, with a T here for trilayer. So this, this you know, was published a few months ago, uh, both the group of Philip Kim and my group in back to back papers on the same week in Science and Nature. We reported the discovery of a new. A more a superconductor, magic angle twisted trilayer graphene. It's a much more tunable superconductor than the bilayer case. And to some extent, this is, is also quite a bit more interesting as you're gonna to see today. Okay, so with this introduction, this is what I'm gonna tell you about today. I'll describe this system, magic angle twisted trilayer graphene. I'll show you that it's a robust superconductor, that it's highly tunable. It realizes ultra strong coupling superconductivity. And in a magnetic field, it exhibits a large power limit violation and we end some superconductivity and I will end with an outlook slide. All right, so let's get started. Pablo, yep. uh, before you get started, just a good question. Uh, are the twist angles 1.09 and 1.08 commensurate, commensurate or incommensurate? For those data that I showed earlier, um, I, I, I don't know if they are commensurate or incommensurate, but it doesn't really matter too much, okay? Um, people have shown that theoretically that for small twist angles like that around 1.1 degrees, this difference between commensurability or incommensurability doesn't give much difference in terms of the physics. Thanks. On top of that, when I say 1.08, I mean 1.08 plus minus 0.01 or 0.02 degrees, depending on the degree of the southern of the sample. So we do not know if it is precisely commensurate or not. You know, we don't have any way to of knowing that ourselves in these transport measurements. Okay, so magic angle, you know, middle symmetric magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, or MATTG for short. Now that's a mouthful. Let me show you what do I mean by that. I mean this structure. Okay, it's three layers of graphene. If you take the bottom layer, okay, now you put a layer on top by rotating it by an angle minus theta, and then you put another layer on top by rotating it an angle plus theta with respect to the middle layer. That means that the bottom and the top layers are exactly aligned on top of each other, okay? Now, not only they're exactly aligned, in this structure which was proposed by Eslam Khalaf and Aspen Rishwana's group, the bottom and the top layers are exactly all of the carbon atoms aligned, okay? So this is a configuration known as A twisted A stacking, okay? And as you can see, this is mirror symmetry with respect to the middle plate. Now, you know, there has been a lot of related work on mirror symmetry to magic angle twisted trilayer graphene and related work on twisted trilayer graphene with other angles and orientations and multi-layer systems. And in fact, by now, there are many, many papers on this subject, theoretical papers on the subject. Okay, so the electronic structure of magic angle twisted trilayer graphene is very interesting. Okay, if you take your three layers of graphene and you consider the interlayer tunneling T between each pair of you know, consecutive layers, okay, turns out your Hamiltonian, if you do a basis you know, transformation, it becomes block diagonal into two blocks, one block which is magic angle twisted by layer graphene like, but with an effective tunneling, which is square root of two times T. And then another block, which is just mono layer graphene, okay? So this is very interesting. If you remember from 
yesterday's and from the first days from Monday's lecture, and I also repeated it yesterday. Okay? The magic angle condition has to do with this interlayer tunneling. So it turns out for magic angle trilayer graphene, the magic angle is the one for the bilayer case times square root of two because of this is square root of two. Okay, so it's one point one times square root of two, so it's about one point fifty six degrees. This the composition block diagonal of this electron structure means that in the situation where you have this mirror symmetry, okay, your electronic structure. So by the way, sorry, I you know if you remember. For magic angle bilayer graphene, the Moray wavelength was 13 nanometers. For the trilayer, because the twist angle is a little bit larger, the Moray wavelength is a little bit shorter, okay, about that nine nanometers. But likely means that the interactions between your electrons are a little bit stronger. Now, in this mirror symmetric configuration, okay, this is the electronic structure for magic angle twisted trilayer graphene for 1.57 degrees. And as you can see, we have a set of flat bands with remote bands which looks very similar to magic angle twisted bilayer graphene, plus an additional massless direct dispersion, which comes from the monolayer graphene-like part, okay? This is when we have zero displacement field. So when all of these three layers, in addition to structurally being in a mirror symmetric configuration, electrically, they're also in a mirror symmetric configuration. Now, if we, you know, in our devices, okay, we have our magic angle twisted trilayer graphene in a whole bar geometry, source and drain contacts and whole voltage you know, RHX and RHY contacts. We also have a bottom and a top gate voltage, so metallic plates. With those two metallic electrodes, okay, we can apply symmetric or anti-symmetric voltages of those electrodes so that we can vary independently the density of charge carriers in the magic angle trilayer graphene and also independently the electric displacement field in the vertical direction so we can polarize carriers in our structure, okay? When you apply a finite electric displacement field, then you break the mirror symmetry. And as a result, you hybridize your flat band and your massless Dirac bands, okay? So it's finite electric displacement field, you have a hybridization of this band structure. That's gonna give you additional tunability because we can tune the electronic structure, we're going to be able to tune the properties of the system. So do we have evidence for the coexistence of that flat band and that massless Dirac bands? Indeed, we have, okay? So if we measure, you know, Shudnikov, the Haas oscillation. So there's RxY, and I'm taking the derivative here of RxY with respect to magnetic field. I'll show simpler data in a moment, okay? This is a bit complicated data, but it's just to show that we have that massless Dirac man. So if you measure Rxy, you take the derivative with respect to magnetic field. So Rxy as a function of density, fully factor, and as a function of magnetic field, and you take the derivative, okay? You can see that we have a set of features, these vertical features occurring at each integer. Those are the magic angle twisted by the graphene like part, okay? Which exhibits those correlated insulators, analog analogs of the correlated insulator features at each integer. And you can see writing on top this thing, okay, this parabolic like looking thing, but which has ups and downs. What you're looking there is at the chemical potential of twisted bilayer graphene measured by the monolayer massless like Dirac band. If you remember, I showed you yesterday this chemical potential measurement where I had magic angle bilayer graphene and a separate graphene sensor which was measuring the chemical potential. And there was these ups and downs indicating negative compressibility, et cetera. In this case, we have, this is like having the graphene sensor embedded in your flat band, right? Because you have this massless Dirac band coexisting with the flat band. So you're looking at the chemical potential of the magic angle by layer graphene as read by the massless Dirac band part of the spectrum. Okay, so that's quite interesting. In fact, if we put our chemical potential here and we measure sigma xy, we have the half integer, you know, quantum hall, you know, tech characteristic of massless Dirac fermions. Okay, so that gives you evidence that we have indeed that massless Dirac band. If we apply a finite displacement field, so we get rid of that massless Dirac band through this hybridization, then, you know, you see this band gets washed away, okay? We no longer have it 
Okay, so that shows you that indeed we have evidence of that mass that did happen. So we have this A twisted A type of structure. Oh yeah. So let me show okay. you that we have. Uh, yep. Question. <laughs> um, so um, Tin Yu Gao is uh, asking why the feature at nu equals minus one is missing yep. in this plot. As I as I mentioned yesterday, the feature at nu equals minus one is rarely seen in magic angle twisted ballet graphing devices at low temperature. The, we, we do see features at nucleus plus one, but at minus one, it's rarely seen. We do have a phase transition in compressibility, but in transport, somehow it doesn't usually manifest itself. In a, in a paper you know, that we published, um, I haven't told you anything about this uh, paper, but it's a nice paper that we published you know, both the group of Andrea Young and back to back in the same issue, issue of nature with us on a pomerian chuck effect that happens at nucleus plus one and minus one. At finite temperature, you do see a feature, you know, that corresponds to correlations at nucleus minus one. Okay. But that's at finite temperature. Lowest temperatures in transport, we don't see anything typically in RxX. You see a little bit of a feature in RxY sometimes. Okay. But in RxX, but here actually I'm showing RxY. So, you know, it's, it's not there. You know, there's a weak thing in, in, in this, which is effectively compressibility, but it's rarely present. So that's consistent with what we'd expect from mm -hmm. bilayer graphene. There's a second question uh, by Mikel Garcia. Um, were uh, this, uh, these band features the motivation to study, I guess, a uh, uh, trail layer system? And if not, what was the idea that led to study this uh, trail layer, twisted mm -hmm. trail layer? Very good. So there are many motivations. The perhaps the simplest, you know, is the fact that we wanted to see if this, you know, more superconductivity is just a singular, only happens once, magic angle by and there's no other more system that exhibits robust superconductivity. It's it's you know it's nicer if it's you know more more if there are more robust more superconductors. So we wanted to see if this was the case and as you will see, this is the case, okay? So that's one motivation. For me personally, the other motivation is that systems that have coexisting flat bands and massless Dirac bands are quite interesting. For example, some of you may know that a electronic structure, a type of lattice that exhibits coexistence of flat bands and Dirac, massless Dirac bands is for example, the Kagome lattice, okay? And a lot of people think that that coexistence of flat and uh, massless bands can be a, a rich, you know, fertile ground for interesting correlated physics. Yeah? So I remember I was in a conference a few years ago and a Japanese theorist, Aoki, gave a talk in which he claimed that a secret to go towards very strong coupling superconductivity, very high TC superconductivity was to have coexistence of massless and massive you know, uh, bands, okay? So that was for me personally also motivation to investigate this system where there is coexistence. Now in the Kagome lattice, you know, the massless band, the flat band is typically very far away from the Fermi energy and on top, at the very top of the massless band. But here, as you can see, the massless and the flat band, you know, the direct point of the massless band is very close to the mm -hmm. charge neutrality of the flat band and both coexist and they're very close to the Fermi energy. So in some sense, this realizes something that people look a lot for in, in Kagome lattices. So that, those um, were my personal motivations. Thanks. Uh, maybe just briefly, uh, maybe you're going to mention this later on, but can you comment on band topology of uh, magic angle twisted, uh, I guess, okay. twisted tri layer <laughs> compared yeah, to yeah. Uh, twisted bilayer? So, the, so again, because the flat band is a magic angle twisted bilayer -like graphene like flat band, okay, this Hamiltonian, you know, is literally the Hamiltonian of magic angle bilayer graphene, okay? That means that block is part of the Hamiltonian in means that all the topology and everything is exactly the same, okay? For, for that. Okay. So everything that you can think of for the bilayer case, at least at zero displacement field is similar for the trilayer case for the, for the flat band. Good. Thanks. All right, so let me show you that we have a robust superconductor. Okay? So again, what do we wanna see? We wanna see first zero resistance. And indeed, if you measure the resistivity 
of what you call the trilayer graphene is multiple temperature. You see this, you know, drop to zero. You can fit this with the halperin mesol formula and extract a BKT, you know, Bresoski costly thalamus transition temperature, which in this case is about 2.3 Kelvin. TC at 50% normal state resistance, which is very often quoted in these two-dimensional superconductors, it's about you know, 2.9 Kelvin. Yeah? Uh, you also want to see flat voltage current characteristics with sharp switching, and indeed, here you go, at base temperature, very flat, sharp switching. You can do this as a function of temperature and do a BKT analysis of the voltage current characteristics and extract, you know, same BKT temperature. Yeah? Now, you want to, you know, this is an electrically tunable superconductor also, okay? So this is the resistivity versus filling factor in the region around two holes per motor unit cell. So we have a big superconducting dome at minus two minus delta and a small one at minus two plus delta, similar to the bilayer case. If you go to the region of two electrons per motor unit cell, you have a big dome and a small one, okay, for extra electrons and holes with respect to this. So this looks, relatively similar to the way magic angle bilayer looks like. Then we wanna see the effect of a magnetic field. So first of all, we see a suppression of magnetic field. So for example, if you're at optimal doping where superconductivity is very robust, then you see that if you measure the differential resistance as a function of current bias, you know, the, the strength of this darkness is the, the black region talks about the critical current. So the critical current goes down initially fast, you know, 100 millitesla scale, and then it has a long tail up to about half a Tesla, okay? And then if you, rather than being an optimal doping, you go to a region where, you know, near the edge of the superconducting dome, where again, your system breaks into superconducting and non-superconducting islands, then you can see characteristic oscillations, which are Fraunhofer-like oscillations of your critical current. Again, establishing that you have just some phase coherence, okay? So magic angle twisted trilogy turns out to be a robust superconductor. And by now, there are at least, I'm aware of at least three groups that have reproduced these results. Okay, so let me show you there is a much more highly tunable system in the bilayer case. So, because now we have these two knobs, the density charge carriers, which we also had in the bilayer case, but now the electric displacement field, which didn't do too much for the bilayer case, then we can plot our resistivity as a function of those two factors, okay? Filling factor or density, again, from minus four to plus four, we're going from four holes per more unit cell to four electrons per more unit cell, and then the displacement field, okay? And as you can see, this is the resistivity, and this is quite a complex phase layer, okay? So let me guide you. Superconductivity is the light blue regions, so zero resistance, okay? Resistive features, highly resistive features are in yellow. Okay, so now you can think of this diagram and immediately, you know, you can look at this diagram and immediately notice a certain degree of symmetry. Okay, first of all, there's symmetry between the top and the bottom part of this diagram. Okay, so you can see you're supposed to be here, here, there's a branch here, there's a branch here. Okay, similarly here, even this thing, you know, gets repeated here and so on. Okay, also these features get repeated, okay, bottom and top. So that tells you that the bottom twist angle and the top twist angle, you know, between layers one and two and between layers two and three, it's, you know, very similar, okay, or you know, probably you know, almost identical because otherwise you would see a symmetry, you know, when you polarize your carriers with your displacement field. Now, the other thing that you can see it is that, okay, now it becomes something of this half, you know, half full, half empty glass of water. You can think of left and right as having a lot of symmetry, or you can focus on the asymmetry, okay? There is certainly some symmetry. For example, you can see the superconductivity that occurs mostly between filling factors minus two and minus three, and between two and three, okay? And we have also some branches which cross into minus one, minus two, and also here into one and two. So that's some degree of symmetry at the same time, you can see that some of the resistive features that appear here, they do not appear certainly with the same intensity on the left side, okay? So there is some asymmetry between electrons and holes. And if you remember in magic angle twisted by graphene, there was also a certain degree of asymmetry between electrons and holes with respect to charge neutrality, 
Okay, so that's sort of reminiscent. Now, what we can do is we can try to measure some other property of the system, okay, and see if we can find correlations between that property and the features that we see here in the resistivity phase diagram. Okay? So the quantity that we decided to look at was the normalized hole density. Okay, so the hole density in H, which you get through uh, measurements of your hole voltage, okay, so a finite magnetic field, that's telling you essentially. Uh, what is the density of, of free carriers available to conduct, okay? So if you multiply by four, remember by four because of spin value, and then divide by the number of electrons per more unit cell, okay? This is the equivalent of the filling factor, but for the free carrier density available for transport, okay? So we can measure that quantity, the normalized hole density as a function again of filling factor and displacement field. And you see that we have again a relatively relatively complex phase diagram. Okay? Now, to see this order, all of the features, you know, most of the features in this diagram can be assigned to one of the following three situations. Okay, you know, there are details that vary, etc. but to see this order, that's the case. So first thing that we can assign these features are you know, some features correspond to a gradual change in sign of the normalized hole density, okay? Normalized hole density goes from negative to through zero smoothly to positive. That's a behavior that corresponds to gap or direct points, okay? Why? Because, you know, at a, you know, when you reach a gap or when you reach a direct point, your density of free carriers is zero. So your, your hole density goes through zero smoothly, okay? That happens here, for example, at charge neutrality. You see, you go from dark blue to light blue, white, light red, darker red, okay? So it happens at charge neutrality. Now, another feature that you can have, we call them resets of your normalized hole density, okay? These correspond to those phase transitions, okay? Remember the cascade of phase transitions? So you have a reset of your you know, normalized hole density when you flavor polarize and your carriers go back near to charge neutrality. Okay, so that can happen, you know, in, in red or in blue. Let me show you here an example in blue. You go from light blue to dark blue, then a reset to white to zero, and then you go light blue, darker blue. Okay, so it's a reset type of behavior. It happens there and it happens in other places. And finally, you can have a feature which corresponds to a Fonhoff singularity. At a Fonhoff singularity, your RXY goes smoothly through zero, which means your whole density, which goes as one over Rxy, diverges and changes sign, okay? So you can have, you know, something like you know, light blue, dark blue, then abruptly change to dark red, and then to light red, okay? And that's something that, for example, you can see here, you go from light blue to dark blue, then you switch abruptly to dark red, and then to light red, okay? So there's a function of singularity there at that point. There's another one here and there are fungal of similarities in various places. Yeah? Okay, so now that we have these two phase diagrams, let's compare them. And in particular, paying attention to the superconducting regions boundaries, okay? So we can go and look between this phase diagram. We, I'm going to superimpose them, but superimpose them schematically because otherwise it will be a little bit messy. So this is the resistivity phase diagram, you know, the superconducting phase boundary phase diagram, okay? Dark blue means very strong superconductivity, light blue means weak superconductivity, but still present. And now I'm going to superimpose the boundaries, uh, you know, the, 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 the situations that we found in the normalized hole density, okay? So these red lines correspond to gap direct type of behavior, for example, a charge neutrality, you remember? These orange lines correspond to reset type of behavior. And these blue lines correspond to Fanghoff singularity type of behavior. And as you can see now, a clear pattern emerges, okay? At zero displacement field, superconductivity occurs mostly between filling factors two and three and minus two minus three, okay? And is bounded by resets. At high displacement field, however, superconductivity is bounded by Fanghoff singularities, 
Okay. Now, this is something which is quite peculiar. Okay, so let's examine it a bit more closely. So let me look at these data now, but look at the real data. I'm going to look at you know, the resistivity across this line, that same line which crosses a von Hoff singularity there. Okay. So if I look at the resistivity, okay, so the system is in the superconducting state, and then close to nu equals minus three gets out of the superconducting state. Okay, right there goes out of the superconducting state. Yeah. If I measure along the same line, the critical temperature, the VKT critical temperature, okay, you see that it's finite, of course, in the superconducting state, and of course, decreases until it becomes zero the moment the system stops being superconducting. That makes sense. Okay? Now, I can measure along the same line the effective mass of the carriers by looking at the temperature dependence of the Shulikov the Haas oscillations, okay? And that gives you, you can fit in the effective mass. And what we find is that effective mass increases, 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 reaches a maximum, and then it decreases, okay? The position of this maximum coincides with the Fanghoff singularity here, okay? Which is something that you, know, you expect, you know, close to Fanghoff singularity, your effective mass diverges, okay? And in fact, what you can see is that the Fanghoff singularity, which coincides with the maximum your effective mass, actually corresponds to the boundary of your superconducting phase. Yeah? Now, this is very much unlike weak coupling BCS type superconductivity, where your critical temperature increases exponentially with density of states, with increasing density of states, okay? So in a regular BCS type superconductor, you expect that an increase in the density of states would lead to an exponential increase in TC. Here, not only it doesn't increase, it actually decreases. And at the maximum, when we would expect the TC to be the maximum, it actually is zero. And from there on, it's zero, okay? So this is something which is quite peculiar. Now, I should mention that um, this fact that TC occurs at a, you know, T6 maximum away from maximum density of states, okay? It's something that we had already seen in magic angle twisted ballet graphene in our combined transport and compressibility measurements. So remember the compressibility, you can think of it as the inverse compressibility as the inverse density of states. So you can see here, you know, this is in the supplementary material of our paper, you know, between thinning factor minus two and minus three, there is this bump in inverse compressibility, meaning the density of states is minimum here, but that corresponds in transport to the maximum TC. So the maximum TC is at the minimum in the density of states of the system, okay? So these results are consistent in trilogue of thing with the ones that we found for the bilayer case. Okay, so this is clearly not weak coupling VCS type superconductivity, but let me tell you about the coupling strength of the system. So, we can measure TDKT versus filling factor and displacement fill, okay? Again, the system is highly tunable. So if you spend enough time, you can measure lots of things. So this is TDKT versus, uh, sorry, once, yeah. Uh, it might, yeah. So versus displacement fill and filling factor. Let me project it here onto a plane. And now this is quite complex. So I'm gonna show you cuts, okay? I'm gonna show you a cut of TBKT versus filling factor at optimal displacement field. And then a cut of TBKT versus displacement field at optimal doping, okay? So this is TBKT in the region around two holes per more unit cell as a function of filling factor for at optimal displacement field, okay? As you can see, there is a very small superconducting dome for electron doping uh, around two holes per more unit cell and a much bigger dome for extra holes with respect to two holes per more unit cell, okay? Now, along the same axis, I can measure also the Ginzburg-Landau superconducting coherence length by doing measurements in a magnetic field, in a perpendicular magnetic field, okay? And as you can see, Superconducting coherence length, you know, 
is non monotonic, you know, it has a minimum near optimal doping. Okay. And the supercritical heterostatic, if you look at this axis, it's actually extremely short. Okay. Now, it's very short because remember, this is a very dilute superconductor. Okay. It's in fact the lowest density two dimensional superconductor that exists by far. Okay. But you can go bilayer and trilayer. In fact, if I show you here what's the average interparticle you know, distance for the system, you can see that the Ginsburg and Lau supercritical coherence length in this underdope region and optimal doping is very much you know, bounded by this interparticle distance. Okay. We can do the same thing at optimal density as a function of displacement field, okay? We can also look at the superconducting coherence length. This is the average interparticle distance at optimal density, and you can see the same thing, okay? Now, the superconducting coherence length in the weak coupling regime, it's giving you the size of your Cooper pairs. It can be interpreted as the size of your Cooper pairs, okay? In a stronger coupling regime as we are here, it's a bound for the size of your Cooper pairs, okay? So this means that at optimal doping, the Cooper pair size is of the same order or smaller than the average interparticle distance, okay? So that is again a situation which is very unusual, okay? And it reminds us of this type of diagrams, you know, that people typically are more typical of the cold atoms community where they can tune these things, okay? So this is a plot taken from Mohit Randeria's uh, review in the BC to BC crossover, where in cold atom systems, they have, you know, they can tune the scattering lens so that they can go all the way from deep in the VCS limit, where the average, the Cooper pair size is much, much bigger than the average interparticle distance. And they can go all the way to the extreme BEC limit where your, you know, molecular pairs, you know, the bosons, have a much smaller size than the average interparticle distance. And the in between, when those two length scales are similar, corresponds to the VCS to BEC crossover. Okay. Now, in three dimensions, there is a bound on the value of your critical temperature over your Fermi temperature, which is 0.22. In two dimensions, there is a corresponding bound on TBKT over TF, which is 0.125. And it is reached precisely at that BCS to BEC crossover. Okay. Now, because uh, we can, uh, yep. Uh, I see the effective mass there. I can ask this question. So Oscar Rafek actually has a question. Is this uh, is this Sumnika that has mass of the flat band, or can you isolate the mass of the direct like band? Yeah. This is the this is the. So you the gas oscillations will measure in the effective mass of the flat in the flat band. Yeah. The, you know, the values that we get are, you know, the, the, the density of states of the massless band is very uh, small. We have very few charge carriers there. Of course, they're highly mobile because they're a flat band. But in order to check this, what we can do is we can apply a displacement field so that we hybridize and we get rid of the, you know, uh, massless component of the, of the electronic structure. And then we can see a sort of continuity of, you know, we can see that when we're measuring our effective mass values, you will see them in the next slide, which correspond to heavy you know, electrons. Okay. Um. Okay. So, so, you know, the Fermi temperature is given by this expression. And we know the density of carriers, we can measure the effective mass. Okay, just here as a function of filling factor at a certain displacement field. So we can extract this TVKT, which we also measured, I just showed you before, over TF. And these are you know, the curves as a function of displacement field. We can do the same thing, sorry, as a function of filling factor, we can do the exact same thing as a function of displacement field. Okay, and we can measure TVKT over TF as a function of displacement field. And as you, know, you can see, this actually corresponds to 0.125. So, you know, TBKT over T reaches values well in excess of 0.1 with the maximum you know, coinciding within error bars to about 0.125, yeah, this system. So I showed this, you know, Uemura plot 
uh, on the first day, you know, this tells you, you know, it's in, in log loss scale, PC versus Fermi temperature. Uh, this is the line, you know, T will Fermi temperature. This is T equal TBC, you know, that 0.22 bound for three dimensional systems. This is the T equals TBKT for that 0.125 you know, bound in two dimensional systems, okay? As I mentioned the other day, conventional superconductors tend to be around here. In this purple band, we have, you know, pretty much all the unconventional superconductors. Magic angle twisted by laser graphene, depending on whether you take TBKT here or TC 50% here, okay? Which one could you know, correspond to, to these two lines, you have these data points here. Twisted trilayer graphene, magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, the corresponding data points for TBKT and 50% are here, okay? So this is the strongest coupled superconductor in the world, okay? If the cuprates had the same coupling strength the magic angle twisted trilayer graphene has, they would be well above room temperature superconductors. Okay? Now, I should mention that recent work also by Jose Wasser's group has found another superconductor that also reaches this line, okay? it's which recently published in science. Okay, so now where does superconductivity emerge from in magic angle twisted trilayer graphene? Yeah. So we have a bit more information here that, 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 than we had in the violated case because of the displacement field tunability. So as you can see in this diagram, okay, at low displacement fields, superconductivity is bounded by resets. Yeah. At large displacement field, we have Hoff singularities plus gap Dirac behavior. Okay. So then that tells us the following. Okay. So by analyzing this displacement field dependence, okay, what we have realized is that superconductivity emerges upon doping filling factor two phase, okay, which has a broken flavor symmetry you know, ground state with two Fermi surfaces. What do I mean by that? Okay? So we can look at small displacement field and then as a function of magnetic field, measure the resistivity. And we look at the Shulikov that has oscillations and Landau fan diagrams, okay? And as you can see, both for electrons here and for holes, all of these fan diagrams, you know, you see churning oscillator states and all the topology and everything. So all of the diagrams and states, all of the Shulikov oscillations point outwards, okay? They all point away from charge neutrality, okay? Charge neutrality is here in the center. So on the right, all the lines go towards the right. On the left, all the lines go towards the left, okay? Now, if we go to high displacement field, however, then we see that the Shulikov has oscillations have some diagrams, you know, fan diagrams pointing towards the, you know, away from charge neutrality, but you have others pointing towards charge neutrality, okay? Now, if you point to away from charge neutrality, okay, for electrons, it means extra electrons. For holes, it means extra holes. But if you point towards charge neutrality on the positive filling factor side, it means you're having here hole-like Fermi surfaces, here electron-like Fermi surfaces. So what, you know, the most important key thing, you know, that gave us information about this was in this region, okay, close to filling factor two, so this region two minus delta, when we saw the shooting of the has oscillations pointing towards charge neutrality, indicating that this is a whole Fermi surface. So this is corresponding to this region where we see superconductivity, okay? So what this is telling us, it's, it's telling us the following. At small displacement field, okay, we have this cascade of phase transitions, okay? So you have resets, you know, at each integer that's bounding your superconductivity between two and three and minus two and minus three, okay? In this region, we know that we have a phase transition. We just underwent a phase transition to a flavor polarized state with two open Fermi surfaces. Two are fully polarized and two are sort of empty, okay? As we increase the displacement field, we see that there is a Funkhoff singularity, okay? that seems to kick in the phase transition before 
nu equals two, okay? And before nu equals minus two, okay? Now, because it's kicking the phase transition to a flavor polarized phase with two Fermi surfaces, but it's doing it before nu equals two, it means those two Fermi surfaces have to be hold doped, okay? Because you have, you know, two electrons per mole unit cell in the flavor polarized phase, and therefore the Fermi surfaces, which are still open, they must be holed up because this occurs before nu equals two, okay? So this region of superconductivity had to be hole-like. And indeed, in our Shunikovic has oscillations, we see that those carriers are hole-like, okay? So this gave us the clue to the fact that the important thing for the superconductivity, the superconductivity emerges in the system, okay? As you dope. Okay, either with electrons or with holes, the many body ground state, which has two open Fermi surfaces. Okay. So in this region, that's, you know, that's what gave us the clue. We didn't have this kind of thing with the biology case, okay? Now, it is natural to assume, although it's not obvious, okay, that for magic angle twisted bilayer of thing, where the superconductivity also occurs most strongly between two and three and between minus two and minus three, that this is also the case, okay? But it's, you know, it's not obvious. We don't have that direct evidence like here. Okay, in the last um, 10 minutes or so, let me tell you about uh, the properties of the system in a parallel magnetic field. So if we apply a perpendicular magnetic field to magic and to triangle thing at optimal doping, you know, Applying a perpendicular magnetic field introduces, you know, vortices, these orbital effects, which kill superconductivity well below one Tesla, okay? Now, because the system is a two-dimensional superconductor, okay? If we try to apply a magnetic field parallel to the trilayer plane, okay? And we try to induce the same type of, you know, vortices, you know, like one flux quantum per, you know, more unit cell in the lateral dimension, that would take hundreds of Tesla, okay? So this means these two dimensional superconductors are very good to look at what is the effect of effectively a Zeeman field in the systems, okay, on the superconductivity. Now, as a reminder, okay, you know, conventional spin singlet, you know, BCS superconductors, so the Cooper pairs are spin singlets, you know, up, down, minus, down, up, okay? The binding energy is given by the gap, the superconducting gap, which happens to be 1.76 kV times your critical temperature. A Zeeman effect you know, splits apart your Cooper pairs, okay? So when the Zeeman energy, UMVV, is equal to your gap, okay, then your superconductivity should be long gone, okay? That leads to something which is known as the Pauli limit, paramagnetic limit, or the Chandrasekhar Clockston limit, okay? Which tells you the superconductivity, the critical field for a Zeeman field should be about 1.86 times Tesla per Kelvin times TC in Kelvin, okay? So for a TC of one Kelvin, you expect superconductivity to be gone by you know, 1.86 Tesla, okay? And that again is for VCS spin singlet superconductors. So, you know, we can take our devices, which before we were measuring them in a perpendicular magnetic field configuration, we warm them up, rotate the sample, so that now we're applying a parallel magnetic field. We measure them again at zero field, you know, phase diagram very similar to what I showed before. Particular TC is about 2.7 Kelvin here at optimal displacement field and density. That means that superconductivity should be long gone by the time we reach five Tesla parallel magnetic field. Okay, so we measure this exact same data at a parallel magnetic field of 10 Tesla. And to our surprise, we have an extended region where superconductivity survives, okay? At fields well above the Pauli limit. Now we can look at this more carefully, okay? So in particular, we can look at the voltage current characteristics just to make sure that indeed as we increase the magnetic field, we still have a finite, you know, non you know, zero dissipation region. And we have here this zoom in for, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10, seven, eight, nine, 10 Tesla, still flat voltage current characteristic. Indeed, it survives. We can look at the, you know, zoom in of the 
the sensitivity versus filling factor and displacement field at 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 Tesla. Indeed, there's an extended region. We can watch it shrink, okay? We can now do, you know, in order to see by how much we violate the power limit, we need to do temperature dependent measurements, okay? So we can measure here at optimal displacement field as a function of filling factor of density. So this is the usual superconducting dome, okay? And now we can measure the superconducting dome as a function of parallel magnetic field. And we see that at 10 Tesla, there's still a finite superconducting dome, okay? So now what we can do to do this continuously is we can pick a particular density, okay? And do temperature dependence and parallel magnetic field dependence continuously, okay? Here, dark blue means below, you know, essentially it's like TVKT or less, okay? So dark blue means zero resistance, okay? We can see this profile. So we can take any threshold that we want for, you know, TC, you know, 10% of the normal state resistance, 20%, 30%, we can take TVKT 50%, they all get the same result, okay? We can see that these contours, these contours follow a parabolic, you know, this will allow parabolic expression. So we can actually extract what are the Pauli limits, you know, at zero temperature. And as you can see, superconductivity survives to much, much higher values than the Pauli limit. In fact, the Pauli violation ratio at this particular filling factor is in excess of a factor of three. Okay. Now, there are, you know, a number of superconductors that violate the Pauli limit, okay? And there are a number of mechanisms that allow violating this Pauli limit. For example, one of the, you know, one of those that is, is, has been observed in a number of systems is systems which have very strong spin orbit coupling, such as niobium selenide, which is also a two-dimensional superconductor. You know, the monolayer case, it has been reported, you know, Pauli violation limits, you know, of the order of four, the extrapolation is of order you know, six or so at low temperatures, okay? So these transition method like calcogenides, they violate the Pauli limits, but these systems are well known to have a very strong spin of recoupling, okay? There's this icing superconductivity in these systems. However, graphene has a very small spin of recoupling of the order of 40 microvolts. So it's very unlikely unless for some reason that we haven't found any theories, you know, that was able to tell us a good reason for this, but unless spinner coupling is enhanced by almost two orders of magnitude, imagic angle to central air graphene, it would be very unusual that spinner recoupling would be responsible for the observation of our data. Now, there is also something called FFLO states, finite momentum pairing, okay? That can give you also a violation of the Pauli limit, but it's a maximum violation of the order of 30%, 30-40%, and only at low temperatures, you know, below half of TC. However, in our case, you know, we don't see 40% violation, we see a 300% violation, and it's always present right away you know, at TC, okay? It's not that it starts to violate, you know, at low temperatures, it's always violating by a large factor, okay? So that's why we think that FFLO physics is probably not responsible, again, for, for our data. Now, you can also have, you know, preformed pairs, you know, which can manifest themselves as a pseudo gap that can happen in the strong coupling regime. Remember, because in our system, we're, you know, close to the VEC to VCS crossover. You know, it could be that we have, a, you know, gap values which are much, much larger than what the KBTC formula would give you the VCS formula, okay? So in our case, in the region where we're in a strong coupling limit, that's likely the case. However, we also observe a large poly violation limit, okay, away from the strong coupling limit. You know, in regions where our TVKT over TF is very small, so we're in a weak coupling limit, okay, which we can tune electrically. The Pauli violation limit is always about two, you know, kind of 2.5 and up to three point something. Okay? So we think again that although, you know, a large pseudo gap, okay, preformed pairs 
might be an explanation for it. It's unlikely to explain our data because of the you know, pervasiveness of the observation of the power violation image. Now, moreover, none of those mechanisms can explain what I'm going to show you now, which is the following. Okay? So I have been showing you data at optimal displacement field and optimal density. Okay? However, if we look at this parallel magnetic field behavior at less than optimal displacement field in this region here, okay, we see the following. Okay? I'm zooming now in the high magnetic field region. So this axis starts at five Tesla. Okay? So you can imagine this goes down like that parabolically kind of down to zero magnetic field. What we see is that TBKT, this, this light blue region tells you where zero resistance is. So you know, TBKT here goes down with parallel magnetic field, reaches sort of zero, and then starts to increase again at finite magnet, at higher magnetic field. Okay? This is called re-entrant superconductivity. It cannot be explained by any of the other mechanisms to the best of my knowledge that I mentioned. Okay? We can see that there is this superconducting one and superconducting two regions, phases, okay? as a function of magnetic field. This can be seen not only in, at the level of TVKT, but if you also measure the critical currents of the differential resistance versus current bias, you can also see that the critical current decreases and then increases again. Okay, and you have these one and two regions. Yeah. Now, there are a few superconductors which exhibit reentrant superconductivity above the Pauli limit. The most famous are the family of uranium. You know, these are radioactive superconductors, literally. So it's a family of uranium you know, superconductors. You know, uranium germanium to uranium rhodium germanium, uranium cobalt germanium. Okay. They exhibit superconductivity above the Pauli limit, and you know, most pronounced in this case, you know, could be created a high field. Lately, you know, the, the latest you know, member of the family is uranium ditelluride, which exhibits a super high field reentrant phase. Okay, and superconductivity. Here it violates Pauli limit, and here it exhibits a you know, field polarized phase at high field. These superconductors are either ferromagnetic superconductors, or in the case of uranium Te2, is at the critical point here where is the spin triplet, you know, nearly ferromagnetic but not actually ferromagnetic superconductor. Okay, and they see this, you know, transition to a field polarized phase at high field. We also see, you know, these transitions at a certain magnetic field. Okay, that separates superconducting one and superconducting two regions. Okay, we sometimes see even maybe some signs of maybe other phases, but here resistivity doesn't go precisely to zero. So we don't know if those are really true phases. Okay, so magic angle twisted trilayer graphene is very likely not a spin singlet superconductor. Okay, this high field phase is probably spin triplet, and the low field phase might be a linear combination, you know, of spin singlet and spin triplet, you know, spin valley log type superconductivity. So triplet components in addition to singlet components, perhaps could also be triplet, although there's some theoretical reasons why the low field phase at zero field is unlikely to be just purely spin triplet, okay? Now, with this, I want to end. So I have shown you that, you know, we have now another, you know, robust more superconductor beyond magic angle twisted by layer graphene. It's a system with exceptional, exceptional tunability, magic angle twisted trilayer graphene. It's a non trivial interplay with form of singularities, which seem to trigger phase transitions. We can rearise the ultra strong coupling regime. Okay? There's large power limit violation and re entrance superconductivity, which means that magic angle twisted trilayer graphene is very likely not a spin singlet superconductor. Okay? You can look at the details of all of this in these two papers. Now, in terms of outlook, well, we had it, we have it for bilayer, we have it for trilayer with this alternating twist geometry proposed by the Wiesbanet group. Who knows? Maybe, you know, we have a recipe, you know, in this paper, they have a recipe for how to make this alternating switch layers, the four layers, five layers, etc. So I hope that, you know, either ourselves or, or one of our friendly competitors, you know, one day will tell you about more magic 4.0, 5.0, who knows, okay? It's an important question. What is the role of C2ZT 
symmetry. Okay, this is C, C to Z is 180 rota degree rotation around an axis perpendicular to the planes, and T is time reversal symmetry. Magic angle twisted by and mirror symmetric magic angle twisted trilayer graphene exhibit C to T symmetry. This, you know, and this one group has argued that that's a key symmetry which is essential and may be responsible for why these two exhibit robust superconductivity, whereas other more systems superconductivity seems to be, you know, at best very fragile, you know, much weaker. Now, we do not know yet what's the spatial symmetry of the ordered parameter. Okay, this paper here, this PNAS papers, and I think several others have classified all of the possible symmetries that you could have, you know, or the parameters you could have depending on the symmetry of the system. So it would be very interesting, of course, to if we could obtain information about this. And can we find novel correlated topological phases, you know, for example, zero field or low field fractional churn insulator, fractional churn insulated states? Okay. So actually, um, together with our collaborators, I'm going to copy this paper. Did we post it already? We may have posted it already, I forgot, um, in the archive. Uh, we have demonstrated actually very you know, relatively low field fractional change layer states already in this system. Okay, in the, it's actually in the bilayer case, not in the trilayer case. Okay, so a lot of you know, rich physics you know, is, is, is happening in, in these water systems. And I encourage you all to, you know, both experimentalists and theorists to, to work on this. You know, it's, a, it's a very rich field. So. Once more, you know, my slide acknowledgement with, you know, my, my group members, you know, my extended, you know, my, my group collaborators, funding agencies. And again, thank you very much for your invitation and I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you for all three lectures. They were really, really, really nice, uh, very clear. Uh, I think, I believe Oscar has a question. Uh, so you can unmute yourself. Hey, Pablo, uh, beautiful talk. I have a question. Oscar, thank you. Um, I have a question about uh, the trilayer, the, the twisted trilayer. So mm -hmm. imagine, imagine we are at uh, new equal to two, and we go mm -hmm. to um, larger displacement field where you start seeing the Landau fans pointing towards the charge neutrality point. Mm -hmm. Now imagine we were to measure the Shumikov the has mass for those. Um, new uh, Landau fans and then track yep. it as you decrease the displacement field. Yes. Will that mass, will that mass go up? Hmm? Very good question. So the Shunikov that has oscillations that we measure there, as you probably saw and you've seen in the paper, they are weak, okay? So we weren't able to measure the effective mass for that branch, okay? As a function of displacement field, which is indeed something that would have been nice to do, you know, to see if it increases or decreases, you know. So we have it for some of the other regions, but which do not correspond to that, you know, the 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 the, the two you know, minus two plus delta or two minus delta. Okay, so we don't have that information, but I agree with you, and I, you know, I'm of course aware of your paper. It would be nice you know, the, to tell us if that those are light or heavy, you know type of carriers, you know. And as we get better devices, this is something that I keep in mind to do those measurements, you know, motivated by your work. Thank you very much. 